Okay, so now we start our second system, the skeletal system, which tends to be a lot of fun. I mean, it's, again, something like the skin you can relate to, even though it would be gross to see your bones, all right? You still see the effects of your bones because your entire shape is based on the presence of these rock, right, rock-like tissue, as you learned in Chapter 4. So when we talk about the skeletal system, it consists of... Um, roughly about 206 bones. Uh, the connective tissues uh, that bind this, so this would be the connective tissue proper, it's like the dense, regular connective tissue that we find in tendons and ligaments, as well as the supportive connective tissue, bone itself, and then cartilage. So cartilage is strategically placed on the ends of these bones. Like we said, as I mentioned in lab, I said, hey, you know, you've got two rocks, right, that come together um, in what we call a joint and if those rocks make contact and they start to rub against each other as you move you'd eventually experience erosion and extreme pain right so putting hyaline cartilage selectively on the ends of these bones and, and in these areas where um, the bones come together and every once in a while fibrocartilage you really solve that problem and then the tendons and ligaments allow for some of the range of motion at a joint so just depending on how stable or mobile, you know, because there's a trade-off here, you need to be, you'll see a variety of different tendons and ligaments made of dense, basically dense regular connective tissue. And again, the term ligaments actually is what we use when we connect a bone to a bone, and tendon is how we connect a skeletal muscle to a bone. Right? So um, what, you know, we always just start off with what is this system going to do for us? And, and as I ask you guys in questions, you know, how is this different than some that we've already looked at and, or not, some of the, the things we've already explored and really we've only explored antagonism, but how is it different from that, right? And how, um, how do you meet those characteristics of life with a skeletal system? Because remember, that's what we're ultimately working together for. So we, hands down, no surprise if I said to you, you know, day one, Here's these systems, give each one of them a function. I'm sure that you all would tell me protection, and you'd probably tell me support. All right? Um, so, again, those are pretty obvious. Uh, movement, but remember, it's the muscle that's actually moving the bone. You can move, though, because that muscle moves these very rigid structures. You're not, you know, a gelatinous mass, right? And I said, again, when you consider it, right, the bones are levers while joints are a fulcrum, right? and the muscle provides the actual action, All right? What's not obvious about our skeletal system is the following, that it stores minerals for us. So when we have low levels of um, blood calcium and phosphorus, we can, right, basically the body can activate the reabsorption of bone material. The matrix is all calcium phosphate. And, and release that back into your circulation. And then there's also magnesium, another very important, these are all minerals, that is useful to the body as a cofactor in a number of different biochemical reactions. So we have to have a certain amount of this. So should you not be consuming these, the bone has stored them, and all we have to do is, right, dissolve a little bit of the bone. Um, it stores energy as well. Um, this is not, it's not a big energy storage tissue but it does have, in the long bones, in what we're going to learn to be called the medullary cavity, there's this soft tissue called yellow marrow. And because it is the color yellow, as you see in this picture, and that comes from the presence of fat. Now, if you eat muscle on a regular basis, you've probably gotten a cut of meat that has a bone or bones in it. And so I said, you know, you've probably seen those, if it's red meat, seen that cut through the, the, the long bone, of a leg, typically a leg or a shoulder, and you have seen these um, bones with the marrow still in them, right? And then the one that really throws students is this process we call hematopoiesis. So this is the production of blood cells. So it turns out that red bone marrow, and red because, right, it has a lot of hemoglobin in it, is responsible for um, manufacturing all of the, the cells that you find in your blood, right? And it's because it has these stem cells called hemocytoblasts or hematocytoblasts. And that's the name of the actual pluripotent stem cell, right? 
So um, we're doing this part in lab, right? We're taking a look at the fully articulated skeleton, and then we're taking it all apart, aren't we? All right. So we start off by taking these 206 different bones, and like like any large amount of information you you would you do this with, you you try to organize it based on something, something that's alike, something that's different, right? Compare and contrast. That's pretty standard. So we give you this. We give you that we could categorize the bones of the body into five basic shapes, right? Long, short flat, irregular, and sesamoid or round. And I, I really love the irregulars because I'm like, it's really none of the above is what I think of it as, right? So long bones, these are what you find in your upper and lower limbs predominantly, right? And they tend to be longer, greater length than width, right? Short bones, the length, width, thickness is relatively about the same. So this is almost exclusively your carpals and your tarsals, right? And, uh, and I said again, jobs, Long bones are levers. Short bones give you stability and support. Um, flat bones are just that. They're not very wide, so they're, or depth. They have, it's very, very little depth to it. And so predominantly in the axial, you're gonna learn that the axial skeleton is basically this part of the body, right? I shouldn't include the coccyx because they're not this part of the body, right? Head, here we go, right? The, so in the axial skeleton, you have a lot of flat bones. So many of them that we call of the cranium, then the sternum, the costals, right, are all considered flat bones. Um, the scapula is put in there too, and you'll notice this when you, especially when you look at the real bones in lab. And these flat bones are protective, and they do allow, since they're so broad, right, but again, not much depth, they allow attachment of a variety of uh, ligaments, tendons, muscles, right, ultimately. So, irregular, I said, is none of the above. That's really your vertebra fall into that, right? They are crazy, right? You can't, you know, all kinds of shapes and things jut jutting out, right? There's a number of facial bones, because, again, the cranium and the facial bones make up the skull. And then there's this, uh, you know, with the vertebra all comes comes the coccyx, which is your tailbone. Sesamoid around, um, we really talk only about the patella, though there's other examples of this, in uh, especially in the feet. Um, these are bones that, they, they do happen to be round, right? The patella is very round. Um, and we have some that can be in the hands too. They form in tendons. So they are not, they're not held by ligaments directly to another bone. They are really just surrounded by these tendons. And they help to protect that tendon from compressing and damaging, all right? So they have a, a very special, different role, basically. All right, so we have to look at some of the basic vocabulary, and again, I call it generic vocabulary. And so here, after we've categorized them, we want to look here in the next couple slides at exclusively at long bones, all right? So long bones, which are predominantly what we find in our upper and lower limbs, all right? Well, it turns out, right, surrounding the entire bone and keeping it separate from all the other structures around it is some connective tissue. Surprise, right? Connective tissue contains things, right? You're going to see it everywhere. It's going to surround everything in the body. So here we name it the peri for around, periosteum. All right. So that's, a, and if you got a, um, especially uncooked meat and you took it and deboned it, and even if it's cooked, you can still see this, all right, because it, it, doesn't, it doesn't worn off. If you take like a chicken leg, take, take the drumstick and thigh kind of thing and, and boil off the meat, right, and then preserve the bones. So Clearly, you can eat the meat, all right? <laughs> but keep those bones and take a look at this, these features we're talking about here, all right? So if you took and just tried to, you know, run your fingernail along the bone, you can actually flake off. You'll get, you'll get, because remember, the bone is rock, so it's not going to do that. But there's this nice thin layer of connective tissue. This also allows um, the tendons to attach to something, you know, that's not directly the bone. So um, the bone itself has two parts. We call we talk about the diaphysis, right? Don't be afraid of those words either. Diaphysis or shaft, right? It's the support area. And then the epiphysis, which is really the connection area. And it's a shock absorption area when you, when you look at how it's, um, it's architecture, right? So we do have a proximal, so closer to the point of attachment, and distal epiphyses. Um, these would have red marrow, the diaphysis would have yellow marrow. And then covering, right, where the bone is making contact with another bone, covering that area is going to be hyaline cartilage, articular cartilage is the term we use for this, all right? Now, um, here, 
backing up a little bit, in the diaphysis, right? So the diaphysis is not solid. It would be very difficult to move our, move us if we were, it would just make us heavy and, and clunky and probably able to be eaten because we couldn't run fast away, fast enough to get away, right? So um, your bones, well, are, are going to have centers that are not rock, okay? And that center, which we already said has yellow bone marrow and it'd be all throughout here, right, is called a medullary cavity. Now, to separate the bony tissue or osseous tissue from this soft fat adipose connective tissue, there's another um, layer, very thin, of uh, connective tissue. So just like on the outside, there's a periosteum. On the inside, there's endosteum. And then the cavity as a whole would be filled with this marrow. Right? Where the epiph excuse me, diaphysis meets the epiphysis is this middle area, that's what meta means, is the metaphysis, metaphysis right? And um, depending on the age of the bone, it'll dictate really the, the width of this zone, okay? But where the diaphysis meets the epiphysis, you have this metaphysis, metaphysis, right? And uh, in a growing bone, it'll be an epiphyseal plate. And after bone has stopped growing, it turns into, you, you, it's converted to a line, just a thin remnant or scar that's left over. So this zone area, again, where the two parts are coming together in the middle. So that's the meta. All right. Uh, what else do we see in bone uh, and bony tissue, especially the long bones? Well. The endosteum, right, on the inside here, and so we're kind of zoning in. Here's our periosteum on the outside, um, endosteum, here we're looking from the inside, okay? Now, with the endosteum, um, you get bone growth, repair, and remodeling. So, bone is dynamic, and it's constantly, right, being reshaped and remodeled, but only in selective areas is what we're saying here. So, it turns out that you have here in the endosteum where the you're transitioning from osseous or bony tissue to this soft marrow, uh, you see very active um, cells like osteoblasts and osteoclasts that we'll talk more about later. And so this, right, constant building and changing of bone is, is, is something we, we, we want to consider and it allows us to be able to tap into bone to get calcium and, and uh, and phosphorus. Now, so in the epiphysis and, and areas of the metaph metaphysis, you have spongy, I mentioned already, it's also called cancellous, sometimes called trabricular bone. It is branchy, it's not solid or compact bone. That's the other term we use. So here in the diaphysis, it's compact because that's support, all right? And they kind of show you this here. In the epiphysis, it's not, all right? So um, in flat, short, and reg irregular bones, um, it turns out that most of the bone is really spongy bone, and that lightens the bone and, and makes it more um, easier to support it and, and easier to move. So, but the outer part of bone is always some compact bone, which again, is just organized differently. I mean, they still have osteocytes in both of them, but here again, you would see more active osteoclasts, osteoblasts in areas, and uh, as well as the osteocytes, and these osteogenic cells we'll talk about later. So bone markings, this is a, just a vocabulary, basically. So we group them into articulations, holes, and projections, all right? So articulations are where two bones meet, all right? And I give you examples like the head of the femur or, or uh, humerus, um, in with the, the cavities, the acetabulum or the glenoid cavity. Facets are also articulations, and these are flat, so these, these tend to be rounded. These are flat. Condyles are also rounded. So, again, you got to have some feature on the bone that shows you where the two bones are coming together. Projections, these are often where tendons and ligaments attach. So these are places where muscle and attachment of other bones will occur. And examples of projections are the protuberance, we're not going to look at any of those. Processes, we'll look at a lot of those. Spines, tubercles, we'll look at tuberosities, not so much. Lines and crests, not so much. And then holes. Holes allow the passage of soft tissue. So the big one is the foramen. 
We also have some meatus and sinuses.